We've done nearly 70 blogs and counting on the Karen Reed murder case, and although many of you have read every story we've published, it can be a little difficult to keep up as new information is made public. To understand just how ridiculous this attempting lynching of an innocent woman is, I thought it would be helpful to put together a list of the top 50 things you must ignore in order to arrive at the conclusion that Karen Reed is guilty. If you're unfamiliar with the Karen Reed case, I recommend you watch our feature video, Framed, Commonwealth vs. Karen Reed. This will give you a full and comprehensive background to this ongoing story. The link can be found in the description below. So number 50, Michael Proctor interviewed Jen and Matt McCabe and Brian and Nicole Albert together. This image right here was taken at 9 a.m. on the day John O'Keefe was done. Three hours earlier, his body was found on that lawn. And that's Jen McCabe's car in the driveway. And there's not much snow there. Well, two and a half hours later at 1130, Michael Proctor interviewed Jen and Matt McCabe and Brian Albert. But he didn't interview them here. Why wouldn't he interview them here? Because there was just a murder there. <laughs> and, and they all know that. So they can't be in there. So they need to get out of there. So he gives them time. What are they doing in there? They're getting their story straight. Of course they are. And then they're going across town and they're going to have an interview over there. The friends and family meeting. Michael Proctor gives, doesn't, you know, record anything and just, he knows them all. has been friends with all of them. And I'm sure it was pretty informal. Second thing that there was uh, no interviews conducted by Michael Proctor at a video uh, on video or at a police station. Not one. Not Karen Reed, not Jim McCabe, not Brian Albert. All of these reports were interviews. Not a single one of them is recorded. So everything you're reading about what witnesses said is the testimony of Michael Proctor, who we know is a liar and a an unethical, corrupt cop. So you can't trust anything that he says. He, remember the three-point turn. How do we know Karen Reed did a three-point turn? She denies it. Jen McCabe and Matt McCabe deny it. Well, because Michael Proctor said that she said it. That's literally all it is. So there's that. Number 48. No one besides Karen Reed was ever considered or treated as a suspect, despite the fact that she has no criminal record, no history of violence, and is a well-respected member of the community. Those things matter during murder investigations. Your criminal background matters. And she was the only one who has ever considered it, despite the condition of his body, despite a serious lack of evidence, despite no taillights being found at the scene, nothing. She was the only one who was ever treated as as a suspect in this. They picked their target early on and they worked backwards from there. 47. The Commonwealth story is that a vehicle going five miles an hour in reverse killed a six foot two, 217 pound man, causing multiple skull fractures and lacerations to his arm, despite the fact that he landed on grass and snow. 46. There was never an accident reconstruction report that ever took place. Every time somebody dies in a an automobile accident, the police do a accident reconstruction report nothing like that has ever happened in this case ever and you just have to ignore that in order to believe that, it, that karen reed did this and you have to think that's normal because of course if you did an accident reconstruction you would notice how absurd it is to believe that she killed him going however many miles an hour in reverse and that she assumed that he was dead and felt comfortable just abandoning him there 45 john o'keefe's body had to have been struck with enough force to have flown 12 feet in the air because he landed 12 feet from the curb. Number 44, you have to ignore the fact that the Commonwealth has not even attempted to come up with the theory for how John O'Keefe died. Like that's a big one. They never attempted to explain how he died or how he got lacerations on his arm. Every murder case has a theory. The prosecution has no theory. Listen to this. Uh, the damages to the right rear corner uh, panel of the defendant's vehicle embedded within the bumper to that vehicle is pieces of cocktails. The victim, Mr. O'Keefe, is last observed on surveillance video, external surveillance video from the waterfall establishment that he left just prior to going to 34 Fairview, Fairview, excuse me, with a cocktail glass in his right hand. The same arm that's injured, the same type of glass Wait. that is then uh, recovered from the bumper of the defendant's car. This is the first I've heard of the Commonwealth's new position after, what, 15, 16 months that somehow John O'Keefe was stabbed or cut up with a broken cocktail glass, which would produce these injuries, that makes absolutely no sense. It just doesn't pass the same test. These are not from a cocktail glass. Who did that to him? Is there, is there a new theory that Karen Reed got out of the car, broke a cocktail glass, then wielded 
on the edge of that cocktail glass and cut up John's arm. Then John stood there <laughs> while she jumps in the car, slams into reverse, the best. and hits him with the car. Yeah, that's with what her tail like I don't know. in the back of the head. It's like, is that what happened? I don't know, because they haven't said a theory yet. They haven't explained it yet. They're just like, well, look at him. He's dead, and she did that. So just ignore all this logic and thought and just ignore it. Okay, number 43, you have to ignore the fact that no one interviewed the man who plowed 34 Fairview uh, road that night to see if the body was lying in the snow. You have to ignore that because a plow came through there multiple times during that night. They were never interviewed because they would have seen a body lying there. They would have at least been asked, did you see a body, sir? But they they didn't. And, and, and of course, they haven't even pursued this. You have to ignore that the Commonwealth is withholding several pieces of evidence, including DNA from John's body that exculpates Karen Reed, which they have been ordered by the court several times to give to the defense. Number 41. If Karen Reed killed John O'Keefe, you have to ignore the fact that she knew that the angry voicemail she left him in which she said, I, I hate you, John, that that would be used against her as evidence. You have to just have to ignore that, that they they want us to believe that this woman killed him and is like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make myself look more guilty by leaving an angry voicemail. No, you know what a killer does? They leave like a message that's like, I love you so much, John. I would never do anything bad to you. Yeah. Number 40, you have to ignore the fact that every single person that claims that she said that, I hit him, I hit him, is related to the McCaves or the Alberts, and that includes the Canton Fire Department employee. Uh, 39, you have to ignore that no one saw or heard a man being hit with such tremendous force Force that it knocked him to the ground, nor did anyone hear him calling for help. House full of people, not a single person heard that thud, boom, of a man being hit with such force by, or the screeching of a tire, of him screaming out in agony. Ryan Nagel was right there. Number 38, you have to ignore that John O'Keefe's body had no bruising, no cuts, no broken bones on his abdomen, legs, midsection, or left arm. Despite the fact that his midsection, his hips, his stomach, that area of his body, his thighs, that would have been the part hit by Karen Reed's bumper if he was standing up. But instead, he's unscathed there. The only damages to this man's body are the f skull fractures to his head, the eyes popping out, the laceration in the back of his head, and the seven or eight parallel cuts on his arm. 37, you have to ignore that Jen McCabe claims to have not seen a 217-pound body laying in plain view, illuminated by snow and obstructed by nothing at 6.03 a.m. while riding in the front seat of a car, specifically looking for a body. We went and we recreated the scene. That's what they would have seen, except it would have been more illuminated with the one or two inches of snow. You have to ignore number 36 that Jen McCabe, Matt McCabe, Julie Nagel, Sarah Levinson, Colin Albert, whoever drove Colin Albert home, Brian Higgins, Brian Albert Jr., and whoever else was inside 34 Fearview Road and left that night somehow did not see John O'Keefe's body on the front lawn despite less than two inches of snow falling. Oh, but it's a conspiracy, Turtle Boy. Uh, surely, if one of them saw the body, someone's going to say something. Well, maybe the body wasn't there yet. Yeah, you're on to something. You're so close. You have to ignore that a pool owned by Tim Albert at the home where all the Alberts gather was filled in for no apparent reason one week after the Alberts were named in court for the first time as potential suspects by Karen Reed's defense attorneys. Number 34, you have to ignore that Jen McCabe Googled how long to die in cold at 2.27 a.m. despite telling police that she believed John O'Keefe had gone home with Karen Reed and had never been inside there. You know what the prosecution has said? Is that, oh, well, she was on another browser for Ozone Basketball. Well, guess what else I found out today about that? As an emailer points out, have you actually checked out the Ozone Basketball website? 
And the answer is no, I have not. I've never checked out the Ozone basketball website. And they go on to say that the Ozone website does not have scores or schedules on the site. And I went and verified that. They don't. Additionally, Ozone basketball does not have winter AAU. Therefore, there would be no score to check for Jen McCabe about her kids. Number 33, you have to Google that Jen McCabe Googled how long to die in cold again at 624 with the exact same spelling mistake, H. OS at six that she did at 227, the exact same one. And that she also Googled it at 623, spelled differently, wasn't happy with the way that came up, and so Googled it the wrong way, a different way. You have to believe that that's normal. Number 32, you have to ignore that Jen McCabe deleted all of her calls, texts, and Google searches before and after finding John O'Keefe's body. That that's a nothing else. She called people all day. She didn't delete any of those, just the ones right before and after finding the body. She also deleted a screenshot of Brian Albert's phone number and a Google search for how long to digest food, which could be used by a pathologist to determine time of death. You just have to ignore it all. Number 31, you have to ignore that Jen McCabe called John O'Keefe six times in a panic between 1240 and 1250 AM, despite having no reason to believe that anything bad had happened to him. And despite claiming that she saw Karen Reed drive away at 1245. So wouldn't she have assumed that he just went home. Isn't that what she called, told the police? So why is she calling him like he's missing already at t- between 1240 and and 1250. Next, you have to ignore that the Commonwealth claims that Jen McCabe never Googled how long to die in cold at 227 a.m., but then filed a motion to cancel an evidentiary hearing where Adam Lally could have cross-examined forensic expert Richard Green, who claimed that she made and then deleted that search, as well as the other incriminating calls and tax messages. You just have to ignore that. I mean, that's wild. The Commonwealth is stating, no, those Google searches did that your expert pointed out, those aren't real. And instead of proving it by cross-examining him, we're just going to cancel the hearing altogether. 29, you have to ignore the trooper Nicholas Guarino's extraction report intentionally left out all of Jen McCabe's incriminating Google searches that directly inculpates her. You just have to ignore that. that. The information that they gave the defense was missing all of this shit. And you have to think that's normal. Okay. You have to ignore that the Commonwealth's only explanation for her 227 Google search was that it never happened because she was on Ozone Basketball checking scores, which we now know couldn't happen because they don't have scores on there. Number 27, you have to ignore that Colin Albert called Tom Beatty's daughter, Erin, at 1233 a.m. to ask for a ride home. You just have to ignore that. That right around the time when his phone stops moving, boom, calls Aaron Beatty. And you have to think that's normal. Number 26, that Jen McCabe called Tom Beatty three times between 5.30 a.m. and 6 a.m., despite having no reason to call him since Beatty was not at 34 Fairview Road and would have no idea about John O'Keefe's whereabouts. You have to ignore the only evidence tying Karen Reed to the crime scene are pieces of taillight found by the search team 12 hours after discovering O'Keefe's body. But then you have to ignore that there is ring camera footage showing her... So she's pulling out in the black SUV. And that's the victim's SUV parked. And the defense says that she makes contact, hits the victim's SUV right there, yeah. damaging that back right passenger side tail light. And they also claim you can see, you know, the victim's SUV move, indicating that there was a collision. And then as she pulls away, they say that you can tell there- Oh, look, part of her tail light's missing. There it is, there's a bulb missing there. So pretend like you didn't see that video. I didn't see nothing there, just ignore it. Because that's what Adam Lally's doing, just ignoring that. Number 24, you have to ignore that the Canton police reported finding no taillight evidence at the scene of the crime at 6 a.m. Then you have to ignore number 23, that 12 hours later, state police under the direction of Michael Proctor found more taillight fragments. The pieces of taillight are not found under the snow. They're found on top of the snow, which has now accumulated over a foot in the 12 hours since then. How the hell... Does a piece of taillight end up on top of the snow? What? And a shoe. Somehow the Canton Police Department missed a shoe and a hat. They missed it all. (laughs) None of that was out there. Remarkably, but the CERT team found it after a foot of snow had fallen. Very impressive. Number 22, that Michael Proctor never disclosed that he was a close 
family friend of the Albert McCabe families. You have to ignore the ADA Lally lied in court when he said that this image of Proctor with McCabe's daughters was not actually a picture of their daughters. Those are Jen McCabe's kids. The two kids in the back are, are Jen McCabe's kids. Adam Lally said, no, the girl in the foreground is not her kid. Okay, we know that's not her kid. The two girls in the back are. We know that because there's pictures of them all over Jen McCabe's page. Those are her kids. It's undeniable. But you just have to ignore the fact that the Commonwealth is saying that he's never met the McCabe's. Number 21, you have to ignore the fact that Alarm.com footage from Karen Reed's parents' house at 412 shows Proctor lied when he said the car was towed at 5.30 p.m., which gave him one hour and 18 minutes of being unaccounted for with the car. You then have to ignore that taillight fragments were found on top of over a foot of snow at 34 Fairview Road at 545. You then have to ignore that Michael Proctor knew that that cert team would be there by 545. And by saying that the car was towed at 530 p.m., that would make it impossible for him to physically have planted evidence by 545 since Canton is more than 15 minutes away from Dighton. Number 20, you then have to ignore that Dighton police records show that Proctor called for a tow for Karen Reed's parents' house at 2.30 p.m. despite having not seen the broken taillight and despite claiming that he didn't get there until 4.30. You then have to ignore that Michael Proctor misspelled the names of five witnesses wrong, all of whom were in 34 Fairview Road that night, including the homeowner's daughter, a nurse, the daughter of the town administrator, and Brian Albert Jr.'s girlfriend, that all of them had their names spelled wrong in the report. Number 18, you have to ignore that despite being material witnesses who drove past and were just feet away from John O'Keefe's body, like when they left at 2.30, they would have driven going south on Fairview and his body would have been sitting 12 feet away from them. And you would have to ignore the fact that all four people in that car didn't see him and that the two people in the back Sarah Levinson and Julie Nagel were never questioned by police until over a year afterwards. Number 17, you have to ignore that this loser, police chief Ken Berkowitz, found taillight fragments from a moving vehicle a week after the incident at 34 Fairview Road. You then have to ignore that he contacted a reporter on February 1st and asked that reporter to remove a tweet that contained factual information that O'Keefe's body was found on the front lawn of Brian Albert's house because Brian Albert was a, quote, pillar of the community. Number 16, despite a night of drinking, the Gemma Cabe's Apple Health data shows her moving around the house until 4.53 a.m. until she got a call from Karen Reed. You think that's just, that's normal. Number 15, that Ryan Nagel told police that Karen Reed was alone in her car after he arrived at 34 Fairview Road just seconds before she got there and dropped John O'Keefe off. That his testimony said that she was sitting in her car with the interior light on so he could fully see it, and her hands were at 10 and 2, and that John O'Keefe was not in the car, was not on the ground around the car, and you just have to ignore that testimony in order to believe that Karen Reed did this. You have to ignore number 14 that both Jenna and Matt McCabe claim that they saw Karen drive south on Fairview Road, which means that she never did a three-point turn. 13. After a night of drinking, witness Brian Higgins elected the ATF agent who was in the house elected to clock into work at 1.30 a.m. at the Canton Police Department in order to have an alibi. Number 12, you have to ignore that two minutes of footage from the Canton Library, the exact two minutes when Karen Reed would have driven by the Canton Library and shown her taillight in a state of pristine condition because it hadn't hit anything at the time. You would just have to ignore the fact that two minutes, that th those two minutes are missing and that the prosecution has no explanation for where they are. Number 11, Jen McCabe claims that she saw Karen Reed leaving at 1245, which could easily be disproven with camera footage from not only the Kent Library, but from hundreds of homes that she would have passed on her way home, as well as the Canton MBTA station. You have to ignore that the police made no attempt to get any footage from any of those homes, but they did attempt 
to get footage from Holmes on Cedar Crest and Dedham Street, which is the way she would have gone had she done a three-point turn. Number 10, you have to ignore that the ring camera footage from John O'Keefe's home that would have shown Karen Reed's taillight condition after arriving back home is also mysteriously missing and that the only party requesting the ring camera footage is the defense. Number nine, John O'Keefe's brother described his body as looking like he went five rounds of Mike Tyson while also ignoring the fact that Brian Albert is a known fighter who recently assaulted BPD officer Eddie Hernandez at a Christmas party. Sergeant Albert cut his teeth as a Marine in Operation Desert Storm. He views his work back in Boston as equally important. And he knows it's just as dangerous. So that guy could probably hurt someone. Number eight, you have to ignore that Colin Albert didn't like John O'Keefe and has a long and documented history of threatening to beat up and or kill people on social media and that he had scars on his knuckles four weeks later on images that he posted on Visco. Fuck you, you pussy. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 Bang, cold, boy, you be knocked out. Hey, oh, bang, 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 bang. Number seven, you have to ignore that Brian Albert, a trained first responder, never came outside after Jim McCabe called his wife at 607 and 608, alerting them that a dead Boston cop was found on his front lawn, that he just didn't find that interesting enough to come outside, that he did not see all of the blue lights and hear all the commotion on his front lawn, did not even think about going outside. That did not cross his mind. He just bunkered down in his house. You also have to ignore that McCabe deleted those phone calls and has no explanation for why she did that. Number six, you have to ignore that despite the fact that a body was found on the property of 34 Fairview Road. The house was never searched, and the area where O'Keefe's body was discovered by that flagpole was never sectioned off or treated as a crime scene. As a matter of fact, randoms were just kind of walking through the neighborhood, gawking at it during the middle of the day. Again, this is around 9 a.m. There's no one's there. There's no tape, nothing. Body was literally found right there. Think of how easy it would have been to come out and do the Shawshank Redemption thing, right? Sprinkle, sprinkle through your pants. A little tail light here, a little tail light there. Maybe a shoe here. Toss it around. Oh, where'd that come from? Number five, John O'Keefe's phone moved up and down flights of stairs inside, according to a forensic expert who does this for a living, inside 34 Fairview Road from 1221 to 1224, despite testimony from the Alberts and McCabe's, they never stepped foot in that house. Again, the Commonwealth claims that they have an expert who will refute this, but they then filed a motion to cancel the evidentiary hearing where that expert could make her case to the court and explain why the other expert was wrong. They canceled the goddamn hearing. Number four, you have to ignore that after being named as a suspect by Karen Reed's attorneys, Brian Albert not only sold his family home that had been in the family for multiple generations, but also got rid of their six-year-old family German Shepherd and then had his basement floor replaced. Number three, you have to ignore that John O'Keefe's phone was discovered underneath his body, not in his pocket, underneath his body, indicating that it had been planted there and that the phone stopped moving at 12.31 a.m. after ascending and descending stairs minutes earlier, and then began moving again after police found his body. Number two, you have to ignore that he had a lateral gash. Like, look at that gash on the back of his head. Oh, no, stop showing autopsy photos. Nope, probably going to show it many times more now. What about if his family sees that? Oh, good, I hope they see it. I hope they do see it. Because when they see this, they'll know that Karen Reed couldn't do this. This laceration to the back of the head, which looks to be in the shape of something linear, right? That looks like somebody took something blunt and flat, like, I don't know, a weightlifting weight, something like that, and hit him in the back of the head, causing a skull fracture and causing his eyes to pop out. But you, you have to ignore that and believe that somebody going five miles an hour in reverse did that. And then the body fell on snowy grass and somehow snowy grass caused this snowy grass caused that 
and he was hit with such force and such speed, but not a single person heard the thud, despite the fact that cuckface Matt McCabe, who sits in windows at parties and watches traffic, didn't see any of this. Okay. Okay. And you have to believe that that's not a defensive wound. And that that is a uh, road rash. You just have to ignore the fact that the medical examiner was told before doing the exam that he got hit by a car. And finally, you have to ignore his right arm being covered in lacerations. And only then can you reach the conclusion that Karen Reed killed John O'Keefe. You have to ignore all of those facts. It's just that simple, folks.